저는 나눔의 집에 27년생 이옥천이라고 합니다. 나 똘록 All I wanted to do was to wash away. Wash away all the shame, the dirt, everything. Just wash it away, wash it away. Just outside of Seoul in Gwangju City in Korea stands the House of Sharing, both a museum and home to the surviving comfort women, or haimonis, meaning grandma in Korean. It's no longer a rare sight to see groups of foreigners taking tours of the museum in various languages. These tour guides, ranging from Canadians to Japanese to French, are volunteers, who also study the issue to educate more people. Um, this is an issue that's really important to me as, as a woman and, you know, as someone interested in human rights. Um, and when I first came to the museum last year, I was very uh, moved by what I saw here, and so I wanted to be a part of the team. The Haimonis, all in their 80s and 90s, are weak and fragile, but on days when they can work up the strength, they tell their stories to students from all over the world. The Haimani recounts her herring past of 70 years ago, and for many of these younger generation, it's shocking history they never learned in school. J'étais déjà venue une fois en Corée euh, il y a quelques mois, et j'ai vu dans mon guide, euh, il y avait un petit paragraphe à propos de ça. J'ai été choquée parce que euh, on parle pas du tout de ça en France. Je connaissais pas du tout. Et euh, oui, il faut que plus de gens soient soient au courant de ce qui, qui s'est passé pendant la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Donc voilà. Now, nearly seven decades have passed since the end of World War II. Out of the 234 Korean women who officially registered themselves as comfort women, or the victims of sexual slavery by the Japanese military during World War II, only 58 of them remain alive. Roughly two-thirds have passed away, having never seen the Japanese government take full state responsibility for what they've done. Now the remaining handful continues to fight a fierce war of their own, and it's not a case that's limited to this country. Manila, the Philippines. Not only is it the most densely populated cities in the world, it's also the capital of one of the fastest growing economies in Asia. But the architectural legacy of the city's past is testimony to its troubled history. While most are from the Spanish colonial period, for the people of the Philippines, they are more so reminders of a harrowing past during World War II. Built in 1587, 
San Augustin Monastery is closely tied to the history of the Philippines, and that includes the Japanese occupation during World War II. The whole church was turned into a concentration camp for prisoners, and various tortures and atrocities were committed on the local people, as well as the sexual enslavement of the Filipino women by the Japanese military. Just outside the city of Manila in Quezon City is the Lila Pilipina Lola Center, a community center for Lolas, the local Tagalog word for grandmothers. But the Lolas here aren't just ordinary elderly. They are victims of military sexual slavery during World War II. What is your name? I am Lola Pilar Preyas. How old were you when the Japanese took you? I am 16 years old during the time. Uh, my name is Narcisa Claveria. Nung kinuha ako ng Japanese soldier, 13 years old. 1943, I am 14 years old. Lola is still a little bit. Uh, I am uh, 83 years old this coming. Out of the 173 Filipino women who came forward as victims of the Japanese sexual slavery, nearly one half of them have passed away. And the remaining handful of survivors still live with open wounds, their dark past haunting them nearly 70 years on. Gabi gabi yan, ginagawa nila sa amin yan. Kaya yung kapatid kong isa, nasiraan ng ulo. Kasi hindi lang naman ni isa mangre-rip sa'yo eh. Dalawa, tatlo. Japanese soldier asking me her language, but I do not know the language of the Japanese. Kinuna ko dito. At saka, he get the jungle knife here in this part. And then he uh, stab me here. Look at my personal appearance. They're riding in the trap three Japanese, and they gave, take me to the garrison. I was raped there in the garrison. Since the establishment of the organization in the early 1990s, the Filipino comfort women have been carrying out various activities demanding apology and justice from the Japanese government but that number has been on a fast decline in recent years. This picture, all of them, she died um, 2005. This one, 2005 also. Lola Rosa Henso, 1997. Lola Francisca Austari, she died um, four years ago. And Lola Purification, last August, she died. The women suffered under the Japanese military sexual slavery. They destroyed the uh, human rights and the social rights of the individual. The right to study, uh, the right to be uh, with people. We do not have to suffer that the society will ostracize us, you know, will isolate us. For San Diego is part of the structures of Manila referred to as intramuros. During World War II, the defense fortress built by the Spanish was captured by the Japanese Imperial Army and used as prison camps and dungeons. At this fortress, in these cells, Filipino prisoners of war lost their lives and women were kept locked to serve the Japanese military as sex slaves. Lola Hilaria rarely comes to this site as it brings back sorrowful memories of her close friend Lola Asian. During the war, Asiang was held captive and raped by the Japanese military, during which she saw her husband covered in blood being thrown into the dungeon. Lola Asiang can no longer tell her story as she has become completely senile. Lola Asiang is there. Lola Asiang was there, but, oh, oh. but here... Her husband, uh, her husband who was tortured and then thrown here because at high tide, the water goes up from the river. So she is there. And then she said, my husband. Mm -hmm. So that is her story, no? 
For Lola Hilaria, this is a place of exceptional pain and agony. Because we, we are a very good companion. She always say to me, pray for me. That's why I, I, I always remember Lola as young. Back at the Lola's house, the now-aged Lola's in their frail, wrinkled bodies wonder just for how much longer their minds will remain agile to recount their stories, or if ever they will stop living in their somber past. The Lola's were growing old. Firstly, they were uh, growing weak. So, so many were sick, no? So many died already. So I fear that it might not be in the lifetime of the Lola. So we advocates, we fear that the Japanese government will be too late. And I think the whole world should also contribute their effort, their initiative, or whatever in the eradication of violence on women. It's hard to imagine the village of Mapanika looking any different today from 70 years ago. A small settlement surrounded by rice paddies. You would think it's a typical rural village inhabited by typical rural folks. But this small village just north of the nation's capital is home to one of the Philippines' best-kept wartime secrets. Virginia Suarez, a human rights attorney from Manila, has been helping the victims of Mapanike or Malaya Lolas for almost a decade now. She tells me shame was the primary reason for these victims to remain silent for more than half a century. On November 23, 1944, mm -hmm. itong Mapanike, binomba ng mga sundalong Hapon. Maraming tinamaan ng the handful of these Lolas still vividly remember that day 70 years ago, and they begin to share the memories so brutal that they can barely bring themselves to speak about. Lola Pilar Galang was 14 years old when the Japanese came. Pala, nagpayong aking kamay na ganun. Saka kinuha na ko ng hapon, sinalakay ako. Nang magising ako, na, mm, natulog ako kanwari, natulog ako sa, sa sakit ng dinamdam ko. Nang panluray-luray ang aking katawan, nakita ko may dugo ang aking damit sa ilalim. But that's not all she says. It's then that her voice begins to crack and tears roll down the deep wrinkles carved by years of agony. Ang tatay ko, sinaksak ng bayoneta. Ang kapatid ko, pinapalo ng kahon na, ma na mahaba. <laughs> Kaya pag nabubuksan yan, parang punong-puno ang aking kwan pag naaalala ko yung ginawa sa mga magulang ko, pinatay nila. Punong-puno ang parang akong gusto rin mamatay. Attorney Virginia Suarez explains that the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal in 2000 had concluded that the mass rape of the women of Mapanike was organized and systematic in nature. Pinagpapano nila, pinarusahan nila ng todo, merong tinutulong ari, may naiwa itong lamaneto, pinasisigarilyo, pilit na pinakamin ng mga hukbalahap. The, the, the suffering that they have committed, that's uh, the unspeakable terror that they felt when they were abused, that's really injustice. Uh, this case is a crime against humanity. This is, I think, is the ultimate violation of human rights. Bahaina Pula, or the Red House as they call it, the now 86-year-old Lola unlocks the gate 
allowing us into the darkest and most difficult corners of their lives. To this day, the women of Mapanike, all of them now in their 80s, remember their ordeal with chilling clarity. Two childhood friends, Lola Lita and Lola Perla, were among the hundreds of girls and women who were raped repeatedly over the course of days. It was dark, they recount, and there were some 200 soldiers lying around. Pagkatapos, pinaghila-hila kami riyan ng mga hapon. Kanya-kanyang kwarto, meron dun sa baba, meron sa taas. It was here, on one November day in 1944, that Japanese soldiers took turns violating the Filipinas. They raped a mother and her daughter at the same time in one of the many rooms. Within one night, the two old ladies recall, we lost our youth, we lost your innocence. Because the sorrow never ended there, it still continues to this day. Sa loob ng 24 oras, dinanas ko ang kataktak na hirap, parusa, gutom. They were already victimized in 1944, and they remain victims even up to today. And the victimization against these women continue for the last almost 70 years. Why? Because until now, they haven't received any, you know, any genuine public apology. They haven't received any justice. So, you know, the, the, considering the lapse of time, that's another injustice to them. What happened on November 23rd, 1944, what the young girls of this remote village had to witness, what they had to endure, what they've had to leave buried in their hearts and their minds for half a century. This house may soon be the only witness around here to remember those painful cries, the helpless wailings from those nights. My Pagasa Paba, is there hope? The handful of survivors ask. Bundled up in raincoats fighting frigid temperatures in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul are haimonis, or Korean survivors of the Japanese military sexual slavery. It's not a rare sight to catch as they have been protesting every Wednesday since January 1992. But the number of these haimonis has been dwindling, and rapidly in recent years, says this man snapping photos of the survivors. Photojournalist An Se-hung tells me he has been taking photographs of these Korean women since the 1990s. Carefully untying the knot to his portfolio, he unveils a whole new world to a whole new group of haimonis that might have gone forgotten. They are Korean comfort women taken to the front lines of the Japanese battleground who never got to make their way home. It's part of his Juju project, a photo exhibit of Korean women who were left behind in China after having served as sexual slaves for the Japanese military. 
juju, which means layer by layer in Japanese, represent their wrinkles carved deep in their faces, the pain and anger that's piled up in their hearts. But soon, An says, there may not be any more grandmothers left for him to find and take photographs of. Each year is different, he says. They grow weak by day. The 40-year-old photographer continues to stay committed to this project because he believes if we stop documenting these women's lives, if people stop remembering those victims, their story will vanish behind the dark side of history. Trapped in time, living in the past, haunted by memories. 당연히 전쟁이 끝나면은 모든 사람들이 고향에 돌아와야 하거든요. 근데 이 할머니들은 전쟁의 최전선 오지에서 일본 군인들이 이 할머니들을 버리고 갔거든요. 그리고 이 할머니들은 자기가 중국에 어디에 와 있는지도 모르는 상황에서 그냥 버려진 채. 그리고 그런 할머니들을 찾아서 그 할머니들에게 뭔가 할수 있는 일을 하기 위해서 제가 중국 땅을 이제 밟기 시작했습니다. 하 아마 or Grandma Ha greet us with a warm smile. In a small worn-out Chinese building in Wuhan, China, we found 86-year-old Ha Sang Suk, often called Ha Ama in Chinese. She's only one of the hundreds of thousands of Korean women who were forcibly taken to China and never returned home. What happened some 70 years ago is something she dreads to recall. <laughs> Ha Sang Suk Ama was kidnapped and brought to Wuhan by the Japanese army when she was only 16 years old. She still remembers that day. Running through her mind are the haunting memories of the past, the dreadful years that ruined her life, and the dying wishes of the other girls with whom she shared those harrowing times with. <laughs>
Even after the war ended, Ha'ama never returned back to her motherland out of shame and disgrace. Instead, she found a life and a family in China. Ha Ama now lives with the younger of her two daughters, both of whom never knew about their mother's Korean roots until they were older, let alone of her tragic past. As women themselves, Ha Ama's daughters can now relate to the pain their mother has been through. All they want now is to make the last days of her mother less painful, distant from the atrocities of the past. Nearly 70 years have passed, but Ha Sang Suk Ama says no number of years, not even a lifetime, could break her free of those excruciating memories. <laughs> Only a few blocks away from where Ha Sang Suk Ama lives is Chichingli District. It's now home to many low income residents of this city, but 70 years ago, it laid out quite a different scene. This is the very military brothel where the 85-year-old Ha Sang Suk endured the year-long period that completely destroyed her life. Take a look at this. Each unit, numbered by the Japanese military during World War II, held about a dozen teenage girls of various nationalities. Now, in this district alone, there are roughly 20 of these units. Locked up in this military brothel were about 280 so-called comfort women. Huang says he knew he was moving into a building that used to be a comfort station for the Japanese army. Xu Ming Ting is a historian who spent most of his life studying the modern history of Wuhan. He believes comfort stations in Wuhan had been planned for a long time as Wuhan was captured by the Japanese in late October and the brothels opened in early November. <laughs> Walking down the alley that once used to house hundreds of girls there to serve the Japanese soldiers, the 96-year-old historian says the brutality was far worse than we could ever imagine. <laughs> 
遵守了这个新崔成立后得了病死的。嗯，所以讲，我就是说，无论咱们家这就是那么的，很早的嘛的，他他说没有什么，哎呦，我的妈，这现在个还是喊了多少年了？मैं मैं सलाम चाहूँ कि सारे मिचोर चाहे और मेरा वो ना बस हाथ जंस देगा सार As the largest city by population in China, Shanghai is a global city with influence in commerce, culture, media, fashion, and technology. The great metropolis is also one of the fastest growing cities the world has ever seen. But behind the nouveau riche exuberance in Ilan is a history of shame. Standing tall in downtown Shanghai is a European-style building with a hint of Japanese flavor. It's the very first Japanese military comfort station in the world, a local resident explains. More than 80 years later, traces of Imperial Japan are found on the artifact, once called the Daiichi Salon. Wang Jiecheng moved into one of the units in this building 40 years ago and tells us there still remain traces of a Japanese comfort station. Eighty years ago, in this very building, on these ceramic tiles were probably high-ranking Japanese officers dancing, drinking with helpless teenage girls. 67-year-old Wu Yuzhen has been living here all his life with his 96-year-old father. He says this piece representing Mount Fuji was here when his father moved in decades ago. Professor Su Liang is considered the first expert in China to probe into the buried history of comfort women. Su started his research accidentally in early 1992 while he was a visiting scholar to Japan. Uh, so, 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 Contrary to common estimates, Su believes there were at least 400,000 women who were forced to serve as sex slaves for the Japanese army. 并且也导致了性病的流行，所以日本为了防止性病的蔓延，丧失他日军的战斗力，同时呢，也能够刺激他日军的战斗力。With proofs and materials recovered through years of investigation, Professor Su opened the first Comfort Women Research Center in China in Shanghai Normal University. From shoes worn by the victims during that time to testimonies of the survivors all across Asia and Europe, 
the research center stands as proof to Japan's wartime sexual slavery. Uh, these are more than brutal. I, I am so shocked to see these pictures. What are these pictures? Yes, okay. These pictures is about uh, in, in the wartime, the Japanese army, they uh, raped, raped the, the Chinese women. Uh, and uh, sometimes before they raped the women, or sometimes just after, they will take a photo to the young lady or even old lady. Why? Sometimes it was for fun, or just to tell the Chinese people, you know, uh, I or we raped the Chinese woman. That means we conquered your area, your home, hometown. Just sometimes, just to give some documentary to I have conquered, we have conquered a good place. Why should we say this? From history, we see that the Japanese government and 实施了这样一个性奴隶的制度，但是从另外一面看，在亚洲还有很多的幸存者。日本政府对这些幸存者和国家一直没有彻底的道歉。Standing before the illuminating glows and the modern-day skyscrapers, it's almost impossible to imagine that this is where one of the largest cases of human trafficking ever took place. Behind the state-of-the-art buildings, the remnants of the painful past are untraceable. It's history being forgotten, memories fading away. What can we do to hold off time from hailing history? Adelaide in South Australia. With a population of slightly more than one million, the city rises from the middle of a tree-covered plain between rolling hills to the east and beaches to the west. So at first glance, it's impossible to associate this city with the term comfort women. But that's only until you hear the extraordinary story of this brave woman. Hello, Miss Yen. So nice to meet you. So nice to meet you. This 90-year-old grandma's home in the outskirts of Adelaide boasts a mystifying blend of the West and the Orient. At her beautiful home, we were able to meet Yan Ruffahern and her daughter Eileen. Jan Ruffahern was born in the former Dutch East Indies, now called Indonesia, in 1923. She had a childhood that any other would be envious of, with a family with a lot of love and affection. Her life was so pleasant until the Japanese invasion of Java. In, on the 26th of February, 1944, uh, some High Japanese ranking officers, Japanese officers, came to our camp and we were ushered into this bus, you know, clinging on to our little belongings, a little bag, you know. And then they drove into the city of Samarang and in front of one of those large houses, uh, the bus stopped and um, and we were told to get out, and uh, and this is where, uh, this this house where it all started. We immediately sensed this house is to be feared. Jan Ruffahern is one of a few dozen of Dutch women who suffered at the hands of the Japanese military as a World War II comfort woman or sexual slave. You are here for the sexual pleasure 
of the Japanese officers for the Japanese military. Uh, and, and we were in a brothel. The house started to slowly fill up with Japanese as soon as it got dark. They, they all came in, uh, laughing, joking. One by one, the girls were chosen and dragged into a bedroom. And I remember there was a Japanese standing there and I could see his boots, you know, from under the table. I, 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 I can still see those boots. I can still see them. I can still see this man's face. I'll never forget it. And for the next 50 years, she remained silent. But in 1992, at a war crimes public hearing in Tokyo, she spoke out for the first time ever. Even after almost 50 years, I still experience this feeling of total fear going through my body and through all my limbs, burning me up. Tina Dogopol was one of the two chief prosecutors at the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal in Tokyo in 2000. It was the major women's tribunal held in Tokyo in 2000 that looked at the issue and everybody keeps coming to the same conclusion that there were massive violations of international human rights norms and certainly those acts, as I said before, would have amounted to war crimes and crimes against humanity. And in February 2007, along with two Korean haimonis, Yi yong Su and Kim gun ja Yan testified before the U.S. Congress. Six years later, now at 90 years of age, Yan doesn't know how much longer she can go on. And I don't know how much longer that's going on because I'm, you say, I'm just at my 90th birthday. And I've been doing that for so long and nothing has really changed. It hasn't come any near. Drug taking uh, in sport. In our major codes. Matthew Abraham, radio host of a morning news show on Australian Broadcasting Corporation and a journalist of 40 years, was among the first reporters to find out about Jan Verhoeven's tragic past. ABC first covered Jan's story in the 1990s and a few more over the course of the years, all broadcast on ABC National. Adelaide story that Sydney picked up. Right, I'll yeah. I think there's a great uh, uh, drive for justice for, for all the women who are in her situation and uh, the terrible things that happened to them. That's what I think is a big motivation for, for Jan, that, that uh, she wants her story to be told. It, it, it seems to me that, that this should be an issue for the international community uh, to address. Um, and. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, a, a, a apology and awareness. Michael Sexton, another journalist on ABC's news team, remembers covering this story right after she had begun speaking out about her experience as a comfort woman during World War II. His piece on Jan changed how the Australian public viewed the issue. In this country, I guess the perception was that the comfort women were from Asia. And then when we discovered there were Australian women, European women who were also part of it, then that became, in a sense, a local story for us. He says as the world becomes more global and relations between countries more vital, it's critical that the international community in Japan make efforts to resolve historical issues without which no future can be created. We didn't know about this story for decades and decades. And, and you know, they need to look at it now. The push with Jan and some others is to try and get acknowledgement, understanding and some sort of compensation, I suspect, while they're still alive. She's running out of time. She has travelled. She has um, had to... It is stressful getting up in front of international tribunals. It's, uh, it's stressful telling a story. It's stressful telling a story like this. I think uh, it, it has been very demanding um, on Jan. <laughs> Different names and mine was the name of a flower. 
and they were pinned on a door in, in Japanese, you know. I, I hated flowers. And I always said to my daughters, you know, when it was my birthday or wedding anniversary, whatever you do, don't give me flowers. I don't want flowers because of what they represented to me. But ever since she came out with her story and began to speak of peace and reconciliation, the meaning of flowers changed for her. I came so close to the Korean comfort women during that terrible part of my life. They're often in my thoughts and prayers. I'll never forget them. You can't forget people like that that have been so important in your life. I, I want to heal and healing, the healing can only come if I can say, you know, that I can forgive. Then the healing will start. And this is a very hard thing for them to do. Forgiveness and reconciliation. Religions of all faiths preach these messages, and they're what life teaches you as well. You find peace through forgiveness. But for the victims of sexual slavery by the Japanese military, a sincere apology is what they need in order to forgive. Time, however, is not on their side. The Korean government at this stage may be in the best position of any government because the Korean Constitutional Court has said that the executive government of Korea must do more to facilitate obtaining redress for Korean nationals, that it is part of their the government's obligation to do more than it has. This is not just a matter of a Korean nation, but in the world, 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 in the female president in Korea, the more that they will be able to, you know, to uh, assist or support or really bring uh, justice for the harmony or for the for the lolas if Korea would be able to get that justice I mean why why wouldn't the lolas get that I mean I, I'm sure that the Korean people or the harmonists are doing this not only for them but for the entire uh, victims for all the victims of the World War II so we're very optimistic about this we we just as as optimistic as the korean people i guess back at the house of sharing in korea kim gunja halmoni also remembers ms yan rafa hern she says no words are necessary for them to feel each other's pain the suffering the agony Eight survivors of Japan's wartime sexual slavery live together in the house of sharing, being the source of strength for one another, because they understand each other, because they were in it together. But time is taking its toll on this harmonies. <laughs> For the 88 year old Hemoni knows it will not be long until she meets them 
again. Over the years, many in the international community have come to the same conclusion over and over again. What was done to these women by the Japanese military during World War II amounts to grave violation of human rights and is a crime against humanity. It's just the Japanese government that has steadfastly refused to come face to face with its war crimes. But throughout our coverage, we came across many expert views that the international community's continuous efforts to document and address this issue is a form of justice itself. So the global community's callings for the human rights of these women is important in its own right. Perhaps one day, the government of Japan would be able to see what we see in the eyes of these victims.